So for the next 45 minutes, I give you Scott Siciliani and Justin Dillon. Justin Dillon, uh, as Jim said, I'm the Southwest Region Manager for the Oregon Water Resources Department. Uh, so I support the stakeholders and the staff that work in Jackson, Josephine, Douglas, Coos, and Curry counties. Uh, as he said, I brought, using my pointer here, this guy, brought Scott Siciliani, uh, who's the uh, District 14 Water Master, which is Jackson, and, or, I'm sorry, Josephine and Curry counties. Uh, the Applegate, beautiful Applegate that we're in today is pretty much split in the half between two water master districts. Uh, part of the little Applegate, like where we're at today, um, is in District 13, uh, which works out of the Medford office. And the other half of the little Applegate is in District 14, which is in the Grants Pass office. So also brought Sue Parrish with us today. Uh, she's the Southwest Region's Community Engagement Coordinator. It's a new position, really excited to have it. Uh, we've got a bunch of materials. Uh, I think most of you probably already found it. Handouts, informational stuff, how to conserve water in and around the home, on the farm or ranch, um, allocations of conserved water. There's QR codes to scan for aqua books or well owner's handbooks. Uh, we've got our business cards. Is there a sign up sheet? And uh, we're starting to put together, or have been putting together uh, a mailer uh, for residents or stakeholders in Southwest region. If you put your name and email and you wanna receive uh, informational updates from the department, please feel free to do so and we'll get you on that mailing list. All right, so what we wanna cover today. Uh, so we're, we're gonna do the big picture and then we've got a lot of partners uh, here through the rest of the afternoon uh, that we'll go into some more details, but talk a little bit about uh, the Oregon Water Resources Department, how we're structured, what we do. Uh, Oregon water law, uh, it is not clear, uh, but we will try and make it as clear as we can today. Uh, we've got Tom Paul, uh, who was one of our prior agency directors, who's been with the department for 50 years that we still go to to try to help us figure things out. Um, so water rights uh, can get complex, but I think we should at least be able to provide you clarity on what requires a water right and the things that don't require a water right. Uh, we'll talk about those exempt uses, which are things that don't require water right, uh, in-stream water rights, allocations of conserved water, talk about drought and some of the drought tools, um, and water projects, grants, and loan. And uh, without further ado, so Oregon Water Resources Department is a state agency. Um, our mission is to assure sufficient and sustainable water supplies are available to meet current and future needs in Oregon. Well, uh, that's, that's a big mission and vision. Um, you know, when you've got drought, uh, you've got population increases, many streams and basins are already fully allocated, which means there's no new water available. Uh, that's a pretty big lift. Um, you can see that the agency is structured into six regions. We just got a brand new region, uh, which is Klamath and Lake Counties. That is now a six region. Uh, just hired a region manager, so that's uh, a building out in process. And we have 23 watermaster districts here in the Southwest. It's districts 13, 14, and 15. Okay, how the department's structured. Uh, so like any other state agency, we've got a director uh, who's appointed by and reports to the governor like other state agencies. Uh, we have the Water Resources Commission uh, who advises the agency on policy um, uh, approves administrative rules, uh, approves water projects, grants, and loans, and who receives funding. Uh, it's a seven-member citizen panel. Uh, you can see it's kind of broken up into five regions, and you have uh, an east and west at large. Uh, under their director is the director's office, field services division, of which Scott and I are part of. Uh, we have our water rights services, uh, our admin section, and our technical services. Those are the scientists. So how we achieve that big mission and vision. Uh, so under the water rights uh, services program, well, you have a water rights program. There's the adjudication program we'll talk a little bit more about as far as adjudicated basins. Uh, transfers and leases, we'll talk about that. You can actually transfer your water rights or, or transfer parts or all of your water right. Uh, you can temporarily do leases like as it, for in-stream. Customer service, uh, we oversee a, the hydroelectric program. 
that can be from you know great big hydroelectric structures to somebody who lives off grid and just has a little fraction of a CFS that just powers uh, their little structure. Uh, conservation, uh, field services division, the biggie is water distribution and regulation in summer. Um, well construction inspection, Southwest region has a well inspector uh, that covers the Southwest. And really that, the role of that program is to ensure that wells, uh, exempt use wells or domestic wells meet uh, basic construction standards that's supposed to protect you as a user, because it sounds like most of you have, uh, are served by a well, and protect the actual resource as far as the groundwater and aquifer. Um, basic water master services, which is just that big umbrella of, of everything to support uh, you all. Uh, and hydrographic data collection, pretty cool. Um, we've got gauging stations spread across, um, you know, the various streams, and by no means all of them, but some of our primary streams um, that help us measure and both regulate based on stream flow. And then it's, uh, we're also collecting that data Right now, we're actually also taking surface water samples uh, when we take a stream flow measurement. And that's going into this three-year project where we're partnering with the US Geological Survey. And this is getting way above my head, but it's specific conduits. Essentially, these scientists in a lab somewhere pass electricity through those water samples, and they can determine what, what, what that water is made up of. Um, is it surface water? Is it groundwater? Is it snow melt? Uh, is it rain, rainwater? or probably a combination thereof. And that's really gonna help us inform uh, the future uh, of the water availability model in Oregon. Um, technical services division, you know, that's IT. Uh, we have groundwater and surface water investigations. So we've got groundwater specialists and surface water specialists that really help us study and work through things. And finally, the director's office, of which Sue is part of, um, you know, they work directly with uh, the Water Resources Commission, oversee the grants and loans, that's the money, um, planning assistance, community engagement uh, through positions like Sue's, and finally, policy and legislative coordination. Monday starts the short session uh, of the 2024 legislative session, so right now is when the department, a lot of folks working over the weekend, I think, of uh, trying to see all of these bills that are proposed out there and identify what are things that could have an impact on the department, and then working collaboratively with these legislative legislators or these committees um, on advising on what are the impacts or as they make revisions to try to accommodate, like, well, um, you know, that's gonna be a problem or that's really good. Uh, we try and help them sort that out. Waters of the state, come on up, Scott. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Scott Cicillani, District 14 Water Master, uh, covering Josephine and Curry Counties. I've been with the Water Resources Department for going on nine and a half years now. It's been an incredible experience, very challenging. I actually enjoy the challenge. I love history. I love trying to find solutions to problems that may exist out there. Distribution and regulation is complicated. It's complex. We're not going to go too much into that. In my portion of the presentation, we're going to talk more about options for you that don't require a water right and opportunities for new water rights and some background information here. So, waters of the state. The state of Oregon water belongs to the people. The Oregon Water Resources Department is the state agency charged with the administration of laws governing the allocation of surface water and groundwater resources. We manage it, we allocate it, we distribute it. Um, to use water in the state of Oregon, surface water or groundwater, it requires a water right or other water use authorization with a few exceptions. Those exceptions are known as the exempt uses of surface water and groundwater. So ORS is Oregon Revised Statute, statutes or laws, administrative rules or rules that guide us through those laws or help guide us through those laws. So. Why don't we go ahead and take a drink from ORS 537-545. Exempt uses of groundwater not requiring a water right, water use authorization from our department. To start it off, we have 15,000 gallons that can be used per day for domestic purposes. Cooking, cleaning, sanitation, taking a shower, drinking water. You may be wondering why is it 15,000 gallons? Because that seems like a lot of water. Well, that is a lot of water. But the idea is that maybe you live in an area where 
there's limited groundwater available. Uh, a lot of wells produce a small amount of water and your neighbor may say, you know what, I'm a nice guy. Why don't we go ahead and share my well? So you may be able to share that well with your neighbor without exceeding the exempt uses, without needing a water right. Next one is single or industrial commercial use, 5,000 gallons. Um, industrial uses, water use at, at an industrial facility, uh, road construction, dust suppression, maybe you have a mining operation and you use water to run your material. Those are industrial uses. Commercial uses would be such things as hotels, motels, restaurants, um, commercial use is associated with the sale of goods or services to the public. So this next one is one that we run into problems with more often than not. It's what water can be used or how much water can be used uh, from your groundwater supply well without a water right. And we can water up to a half acre of non-commercial lawn, excuse me, lawn or non-commercial garden. So use of groundwater for commercial irrigation requires a water right. To irrigate more than a half acre, commercial or not, requires a water right or other water use authorization from our department. Next on the list is stock water. This is water for drinking. Emergency firefighting uses is the last one there that I'm going to cover. But if anybody's interested, ORS 537-545. Next, we have exempt uses of surface water, and we can dive on into that. ORS 537-141 is the statute. First off is livestock water. Does this mean that you can fill up a lake for your one cow? No, it does not. We're talking about diverting water from a surface water source that your animals would otherwise have legal access to into a tank or to a trough. I think the Rogue River Decree actually calls out a 40th of a CFS per 100 head of cattle. So when you break it down to gallons per minute, that's not very much water per head of cattle. Emergency firefighting uses again. Does this mean that we can divert water from a surface water source and fill up, you know, 10, 2,500 gallon tanks and hold on to that for the event of a fire that may or may not occur at some point in the future? That's not what it's allowing us to do. If there's a fire burning, there's an emergency, you can appropriate water to protect yourself. Some forest management practices, uh, such as mixing pesticides for, say, aerial herbicide spraying activities or slash pile burning. We have land management practices associated with uh, disrupting or temporarily impeding diffuse runoff across agricultural lands to address uh, soil erosion and water quality when the intent is not to store or make beneficial use of that water. Fish protection, um, you may have heard of the STEP program through ODF&W. It's salmon and trout enhancement program associated with, I think, incubation of eggs. Water is used for fish returns out of ditches, fish bypass structures. These things are exempt from needing a water right. And rainwater catchment. This is a good one to cover. People are gonna go into this in great detail, I believe, later on after we finish presenting. Capture of precipitation off an artificial impervious surface is exempt, does not require a water right. So we can store that water, we can use that water. Best example I have for you is the roof of your house, roof of a barn, um, a greenhouse. These are artificial impervious surfaces. And I'm not going to go into this too far, but I'm going to say USGS has uh, a tool that you can use to estimate how much water you can capture. Um, and there are resources out there for uh, acquiring approximate rainfall in your area. I just threw this up, a 60 by 60 foot artificial impervious surface, 12 inches of rain can get you about 27,000 gallons of water. That's all I'm going to say on that topic. Okay, so the next part of this is going into water law and water rights. Um, in 1909, Oregon Water Code was established, which was really the, uh, the fundamentals or the basics for water law in this state. The, uh, give me just a second here, I'm falling behind. Okay, so. 
The doctrine of prior appropriation was established in 1909. With that came the four fundamental provisions. The four fundamental provisions are priority, which is the date of your water right or the date that you made claim. This is the date that we use to distribute and regulate water in this state. The older your priority date, typically the longer you may be able to use water in times of shortage. You may have heard the saying, first in time, first in right, or first in time, first in line. It all goes back to the, how we distribute the water and the priority date. Appurtenance. Water is tied to a specific tract of land. Say you have a five acre parcel, but you have a water right for one acre of irrigation. Does that mean that you can irrigate one any one acre portion of your land? No, it does not. Your water right describes a specific one acre that can be irrigated. Number three, water must be used. It must be used once beneficially every five years to avoid forfeiture and possible cancellation. It's an important one to remember. The last one is beneficial use without waste. Water must be used beneficially and it must be used without waste. Very important. So before 1909, before water code, before the establishment of water law, if water users had issues associated with their water use, it had to be addressed through the court system or they had to take it into their own hands, which is where the saying I believe came from or some variation thereof, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. I'm sure it came from some time back then, but it is still very much applicable today. So adjudication, this is how we address in the state of Oregon claims made to the use of water. The different colors all define different adjudications that occurred in the state. From those adjudication processes came what's known as a decree. The decree defines all the claims. This is what the different claimants are allowed and titled to and any um, other applicable information, like how much water can be used for stock. That's a good one. It defines the irrigation seasons. It defines the periods of use or uses allowed. So you can see a lot of white area up here. There are many places around the state that haven't yet been adjudicated. In Josephine County, we have the Rogue River Decree. We have the Illinois River Decree, Sucker Creek Decree. And believe it or not, there's another one over here in Curry County on McBay Creek that for some reason isn't on this map. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It might, it's a very small drainage. I think it's like three water rights. So you may just not be able to see it on the graphic is what it is. Okay, so water rights. How do we acquire a water right? It all starts with an application. Maybe you want to appropriate surface water. Maybe you want to appropriate groundwater. Maybe you want to store water. Maybe you want to store it and use it, but it all starts with an application to the Oregon Water Resources Department. So we make application. When our application is received by the Water Resources Department and it's complete, we acquire a priority date. And once we receive that priority date, we send out a public notice public comment period, OWRD review, and then we eventually issue a final order granting you a permit. Once you receive that permit, you can start to use water as long as you meet all the terms and conditions held within that permit. Typically, you have five years to prove up on a water right. You have five years to make full beneficial use of what you've asked for on your permit. Once you make full beneficial use, you have to work with a certified water rights examiner in most cases to submit your claim of beneficial use. You're saying, this is what I asked for, this is actually what I completed, and the department will eventually issue a certificate to describe what you proved up on. Once we receive a certificate, there are ways to change water rights. We can change the place of use, the character of use, the point of diversion but it's all an application process. Sometimes these things aren't exactly just a nice, easy, straight line, smooth sailing over the finish line. Water rights are complex or complicated. A lot can happen after you submit that application. And then we have cancellations on there. Remember to use your water rights. So this is the breakdown, general breakdown of a water right, front page of a certificate. We've got the type of use. This is for irrigation, 
but maybe it's for agricultural use or livestock, human consumption, industrial use. Priority date, we've been over that one. A pertinency, water rights are tied to a specific tract of land. Our certificate breaks it down to the number of acres in a quarter quarter. The final proof survey map defines those acreage, those acres in much more detail which is the accompanying doc document to your certificate when you submit your claim. The final proof survey map is part of that claim. The source of water, is it surface water, is it groundwater? Surface water being rivers, streams, groundwater typically is associated with a water supply well. The season of use, in the Rogue Basin, the general season of use for irrigation is April 1st through the end of October. That was established through the Rogue River Decree. Our point of diversion or point of appropriation, which is associated with groundwater. Pro point of diversion is associated with surface water. It tells us where can we take that water from the river and where is our groundwater source? Where is the water supply well located at? What's the takeaway from this portion? Water must be used beneficially at least once every five years to avoid becoming subject to forfeiture and cancellation. That's a big one. Water must be put to beneficial use in accordance with the terms and conditions of your water right. That's the other part of it. What is beneficial use? Efficient use of water without waste, consistent with laws, rules, and in the best interest of the people of the state. So the next part of this is options for water right holders. How do we protect a water right? Um, how do we potentially um, expand a water right? And then opportunities for new water rights. So the In-Stream Water Rights Act was established in 1987 and it created tools to allow the Water Resources Department to put water in-stream. In-stream leases, um, in-stream transfers. It also allowed for other state agencies, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, and the Parks Department to apply for in-stream water. So an in-stream lease, why would we do this? Well, maybe you're a water right holder that decides, I'm not gonna use my water right for a few years. An in-stream lease allows you to put your water right in stream. It'll be beneficial use while it's in there. You're allowed to, um, you can renew this. You can terminate an in-stream lease. So maybe you're on year four and you decide, you know what, I actually want to farm this year. You can notify the department and we can terminate the in-stream lease. Uh, Time-limited in-stream transfer is more for longer term in-stream water. Maybe you're getting older, you don't want to farm, you're gonna leave your farm to your, the next generation of people and you're planning on that being 30 years down the road, this may be the avenue for you. The last one, in-stream transfers, this is a permanent transfer. Maybe you decide that you don't want to irrigate anymore, you don't want your water right, and you decide that your water right would be better placed in-stream and held in trust by the Oregon Water Resources Department where we would protect it. That would be the avenue for you. Uh, more than 900 in-stream rights have been established through these processes. So there's a lot of them out there. But if you compare it to the number of water rights in total in the state, uh, it's, it's not as many. Quick question. Can yes. you do a partial, say you're only using half of your water right, you can do a partial? You can. Okay. The next one again is associated with existing water rights for water right holders. Allocation of conserved water. This is a program, it's really interesting. What we're looking at is a way through conservation to potentially increase the footprint of a water right or another water use. Um, typically done through physical changes to a system, um, changes to a conveyance system, changes in the means of how we apply water to, to land, to say irrigation, we go from flood irrigation to drip irrigation. The amount of water that's conserved, up to 75% of that can be kept by the water right holder or sold to a neighbor or various other things, they may be able to expand the footprint for irrigation. Maybe they go from a five acre irrigation right to an eight acre irrigation right at the end of the day. 25% of the conserved water or more goes in stream as a protected in stream water right.
I should point out the mission of the water resource department. Did you touch on that? Okay, all right. So the mission of the water resources department, we're all public servants. We're to serve the public by practicing and promoting responsible water management. And we do that through two key goals. The first one is to directly address Oregon's water supply needs and to preserve and protect watersheds and waterways to ensure the long-term sustainability of Oregon's ecosystems, economy, and quality of life. This program allows for a farmer to um, put more land into production, may help the economy, may help the community, while also allowing for some water to go in stream and protect in stream values. So I feel like this is right on par with the mission of the Water Resources Department. I should back up one slide. I just want to say that there's a regular transfer process. Maybe you don't want to use your water right for a period of time. You can do a temporary transfer or just transfer it permanently to, say, a neighbor's property or for other uses. Any questions about that? Come find me after the presentation. We can touch on that a little bit more. So new water rights. Down here in the southwest region, Jackson, Josephine counties, Coos, Curry, Douglas, not so much in Curry or Coos, there is limited water available for new allocations, especially during the seasons when most people are trying to use water, irrigation season, during the summer months. We have allocated a lot of water in the state. We've been doing it for a very long time, and so we are at a point where there's limited water available. The water that seems to be available now in many drainages is during the winter months when we have excess water in the system. We can apply for a new storage right to store that water and then potentially use that water later in the season, say irrigation season. There are two different applications that we can look at for new water rights for storage. The standard application and the alternate application. The alternate is typically used for smaller reservoirs. However, the alternate reservoir, you can only permit one reservoir at a time. And there are some size requirements. So if we are storing less than 9.2 acre feet of water, or we have a dam height of less than 10 feet, we can use this process. If we exceed both of those criteria, we have to use the standard process. A benefit to that is that you can actually permit more than one reservoir at a time. You can permit two, you can permit three. It also affords you an opportunity to put your application on administrative hold. The alternate process does not. So what does that mean? When you apply for a storage right or any other water right, you may be faced with hurdles. You may be faced with challenges that you have to try to sort out. Maybe it's associated with mitigation. The standard process, you can put your application on administrative hold and sort out those issues. Make your way over those hurdles. So that's typically the avenue that we direct people towards, the standard application process. If you live along the Applegate, if you live along the Rogue, you're below Lost Creek Reservoir, you're below Applegate Reservoir, there may be an opportunity for you to acquire a brand new water right. You would apply for an application for a permit to use surface water. You would contract with the Bureau of Reclamations and there's an annual fee that you'd pay to the BOR. They would release water from Moss Creek Reservoir or Applegate Reservoir and you could pick that water up downstream. Last item I have to touch on here are exempt ponds. Uh, maybe you have heard of a bulge in the system. A bulge is intended to be used as a temporary holding facility in association with an existing water right. An example, you live along a ditch, you're part of a ditch association, you're on a rotation, you get water once every five days, so you move that water into your bulge, you irrigate out of that bulge until it's your turn on the rotation again. We can't hold water in that bulge outside of the season, and we can only hold water in there for a period of not to exceed 10 days. So after 10 days, you should have utilized all the water in your bulge. So you may need to do some math. Make sure you can use what you put in there within 10 days. And I think that that is it for the end of my portion. I thank you very much. Yeah, looks like there's a question in the back. There you go, sir. I'm assuming the alternate is easier than the standard, which is why it's there. The alternate was supposed to be an easier process. But as, as we've allocated more and more water, we're finding that people, those hurdles are coming up more frequently. 
And so we're kind of directing people to the standard process. If you run into hurdles with the alternate, there is no pause button. It's probably going to get sent back to you. All right, I'm back. You miss me? <laughs> All right. Uh, really just now going to talk about reservoirs, storage, and then go into drought and a little bit of the drought tools. I'm going to try to do that in 10 minutes or less. That way we've got time to talk about water project grants and loans. So this is what we call the teacup diagram. <clears throat> These are the Bureau of Reclamation reservoirs that feed the Rogue Basin. Uh, the teacups are kind of sized in comparison. So you can see Fish Lake holds less water than Four Mile, which is less water than Howard Prairie. Um, Bureau of Reclamation Reservoirs were constructed primarily to provide water in the summer by capturing it in the winter uh, to expand Oregon's or the basin's ability to, you know, you know agriculture operations. Uh, in 1910 or by 1910, uh, for those of you familiar with Bear Creek and that part of the, um, you know, Rogue Valley, Bear Creek was fully allocated. So the farms that were there in 1910, without these reservoirs, there would be nothing, there'd be no further expansion. Uh, you can see Hyatt's at about 48%, Howard's at 37% uh, full as far as capacity. Uh, that's double or better than last year at this time, but still below the norm. But we're, we're still better off at the moment. Bureau Reclamation, or I'm sorry, Army Corps of Engineer Reservoirs. Uh, another government agency. Uh, we've got the Applegate down here, and then we've got uh, Lost Creek up there. Uh, Army Corps of Engineer Reservoirs were primarily constructed for flood control, but as a secondary benefit, uh, they also release water, stored water. Uh, as Scott said, you can still get contract water out of the Applegate, you can still get it out of the Rogue. Uh, same thing overall at a basin, we're about 50% full. Uh, unlike the Bureau Reservoirs, Army Corps of Engineer Reservoirs, uh, they have fill curves. Because they're designed for flood control, people are, why are you not capturing this water? Why are you releasing it, right? It's because they're primarily there for flood control, so not being able to forecast the next big storm or what the spring might bring, um, they have a rating curve based on historical weather events. Uh, this is just reservoirs, the Bureau of Reclamation reservoirs across the state is a quick snapshot. You can see everybody but little old us is doing pretty good. Um, overall across the state, this 100% would be percent full for the time of year. Um, so everybody's done well except the shoots and Rogue is the worst off. Uh, if you average the reservoirs, as I said, we're about 66% full. Uh, start talking about a little bit about drought. This is not today. Uh, this was back in November, but drought declarations. Uh, so in 2023, 13 Oregon counties received a governor's uh, formal drought declaration. Um, presently, uh, and we'll see in the next slides, only 17% of Oregon is experiencing moderate drought um, or moderate to severe drought conditions. Um, stream flow back in November, these are actually just uh, some little icons representing our gauging stations. Um, so you can see if you average Jackson County or Josephine County, you were at 60 to 70% of normal. Uh, Jackson really benefited from the rogue there. You can see others in the red were more like 30% of normal. Um, the declaration process, briefly cover that. It, in, in, it's initiated by a county. Um, the county uh, sends that to the governor's drought council. Council reviews it if approved and it recommends the approval up to the governor's office. Uh, if the governor approves it, it's signed through executive order. And what the benefit of a drought declaration is, is it opens up certain tools for the department to help get folks through uh, drought declaration. Uh, the next step in severity would be declaring a drought emergency uh, is a further step. And typically that's triggered when it, things have gotten so bad, you're probably at the point of threatening water supplies, municipal water supplies. All this is separate from the federal government's uh, drought declaration and process. Uh, it is just automatically triggered, triggered by the drought monitor, which, you know, this is the U.S. images of the drought monitor. If a county, uh, if a county is experiencing severe drought uh, for eight weeks or more, that triggers the federal process, or if any part of the county hits the extreme drought. And then there's the federal tools that get opened up. Can I ask you what the colors mean as far as... Oh, goodness. Well, there's no... We'll sh I'll show you here in a second. <laughs> Here's the colors. Uh, this is current. 
uh, so looking much better. Uh, areas in white uh, have recovered from drought. There's no drought. Uh, yellows are normally dry, moderate. I'm not going to go through the rest. You can see how that color coding would be. We have no, just a little area of severe, severe drought. This map looks far different than it did this time last year. Uh, I should just say the near-term outlook, the next two weeks, um, they're predicting at least the uh, Climate Prediction Center uh, is leaning towards above average precipitation below, below normal temperatures. We'll see how they do. Um, water year. Uh, water year, uh, the start of the water year is October 1st. And so you can see here, this is from last week, the water year to date, as far as the precipitation we would expect to have seen by now, we're at 99%. Unfortunately, a lot of that's been liquid. Uh, we haven't been building snow like we would like to be building in the higher elevations, which is kind of that out of reservoir storage. You know, that snowpack up there is also storage for us. Why is that important? Well, in the southwest region, which we're in, 98% of our irrigation is surface water. You get other areas of the state, they have much large aquifers, wells that produce six, 7,000 gallons a minute. We're not there. So when we're not building that snow, we're tied to really what's in the reservoirs and nothing's replenishing the reservoirs necessarily in the spring as they start to move water out of them. Uh, you're not necessarily receiving those inflows anymore. Uh, so snowpack, as I said, uh, there, there's been a decline in recent weeks. I think we've all had that nice t-shirt weather that we enjoy, snow does not enjoy. Um, there's been a reduction of snowpack statewide uh, Rogue Umpqua Basin, we're now about 85% of average. Not all of that is snow melt, it's just the sun's out. Um, and I think after early next week, we're looking at another long stretch of this abnormally dry weather. So it's not so much that it's melting, we're just not building. Which as I said, could be a problem for irrigation in the spring. Uh, we may just have what's in those reservoirs available, but we've still got a couple months, so we'll keep our fingers crossed. Uh, water year to date, um, this is kind of just looking statewide. Uh, you can see over here, you know, in the greens, um, you know, it sh at that time it showed, you know, 97. Uh, Klamath and Goose, uh, they're the worst off. Um, everybody else is doing okay or above. You can see John Day, they're at about 135% of average. Uh, just looking ahead, this is basically the three month outlook uh, that the Climate Prediction Center puts together. As you can see up here in the Northwest, above normal temperatures, so that's not good for building that snowpack. And then maybe average to possibly below average precipitation. Okay, drought tools. As I said, uh, uh, governor's drought declaration um, can uh, basically opens up for the department authorized under statute uh, to provide certain tools to help mitigate the impacts of drought. Uh, this is just a map of 2023. You can see, you know, these brown counties actually received uh, a formal drought declaration. You kind of look at the map and it makes sense, right? <laughs> Central Oregon, you had areas in 2023 that were in exceptional drought. Um, and you can see here Jackson and Douglas counties or Jackson. Yeah, Jackson and Douglas counties actually went through the declaration process. Uh, there's a lot of tools that that opens up for the department kind of the, the primary tools that's kind of the more norm for us down here in the Southwest would be temporary drought emergency water use permits. Often that's, hey, there's no surface water or the irrigation districts aren't delivering um, or I'm regulated off, never got to use it. Maybe you've got access to a well. You could receive temporary authorization through an expedited ap application process, maybe to use that well or vice versa, not norm for the vice versa or there's temporary transfers, um, you know, maybe for whatever reason, if you decided you wanted to move your place of use or something like that, don't know why one would, I don't see as many of those. And I think that brings us to Sue. She's gonna wrap us up for the presentation and then we can certainly entertain questions after, but go ahead. on a yearly basis, seasonally basis? Yeah, so those drought declarations expire at the end of the year, even if the drought doesn't. <laughs> so if, uh, you know, if the, the counties want to, you know, reestablish a declaration, they could, because you continue, they can, just the rain, they can do so at the start of the year or at any point as we move forward. You know, maybe we move back in, in the summer to extreme conditions. 
Hi there. Uh, my name is Sue Parrish, and uh, like Justin mentioned, I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Southwest Region, which is enormous. Um, <laughs> happy to be here uh, today. I was going to just quick talk about some of the resources and ways to participate with us uh, in water management and water conservation. Um, we have quite a few grant and loan programs at Oregon Water Resources Department. Um, some of them are really for like if you're part of a ditch association and some of your infrastructure needs help or repair or you want to find a way to um, convey the water so that you're conserving water more as a group, you could work together and apply to us for that. Um, also, we have funding for things like feasibility studies, like does it even make sense for us to do this? How much would it cost to pipe a, a ditch or something like that? We can help with the cost of, of a feasibility study for the Ditch Association. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to mention about it, I, so I'm going to first say that there are numerous programs. They are a little complex and they take time to apply for and a summary of them is at our table. It's this one. So if you want to come talk to me or grab information about it, feel free. Um, our table is right over there. Um, but I will say something that's kind of important. These are all public funds, right? This is something that through the democratic process, it was determined that it's help it would be super helpful to the state of Oregon to have some funds available for communities. So in order to receive the funds, they need to show public benefit, right? And so to show public benefit, it's going to need to show environmental benefit, social cultural benefit, and economic benefit. And that's probably all you need to know for now, but I would say, if you actually are interested in this and you want to learn about what we call triple benefit, then you might want to take my card that is over on the table and feel free to be in touch with me because um, when I first thought of the triple benefit, I was like, oh, well, it can benefit it culturally this way. But it actually went through like a pretty big public process where the public decided what, each, what the criteria are for each category. So it's good for you to look at it and make sure, oh, yeah, we actually are doing that. Now, the other thing that I would say is that I believe it was Scott, well, I might be wrong, talked about allocation of conserved water. There are different ways that you can start to think about using your water as a group. These, although individuals can apply for some of these grants, uh, most of them really would be more successful if you apply to some association or, or an irrigation district. Um, but if you start to think about using your water so that you all are conserving more water, you can actually end up in a win-win situation where you get more acreage that you're allowed to irrigate and some water goes in stream. And for us, that's a pretty significant benefit. So when we're thinking about the public benefit, that to us is like, oh, okay, great. <laughs> Using the same amount of water differently and everybody benefits, right on. Um, so this is another grant, again, I mentioned it, I wanna spend a lot of time on it. Um, these two I wanted to mention because they actually, for an individual landowner, can be options. Um, water measurement cost share, again, is on here and the specifics of it I won't go into, but basically we can offer some of the cost of either updating or um, installing water measurement devices so that you actually know how much water you're using. Difficult to show us that there's gonna be benefit, right, when you don't really know how much you're using. So um, that's one option. And for that program, you talk to the water master. <laughs> so Justin or Scott. Uh, and then WARF is a program that we're currently out of money because it's an awesome program, but we anticipate in the next year or two it b having money again, so I want to make sure I mention it. And it's for low to moderate income households whose well needs to be abandoned, repaired, or replaced. Um, and we know that that's happening around the region. 
it needs to be tied to either wildfire, drought, or an upcoming situation that Justin just let me know about is uh, if the well has been contaminated. So uh, again, if you know somebody who that might be the case for, uh, feel free to get in touch with me and I can just walk them through the process a little bit. Um, again, we don't have money right now, so we're not accepting applications, but the reason we don't have money is because it helped a lot of people and the session last June ended up being shorter than we thought. So we anticipate having money again some here, sometime here fairly soon. Also just wanted to quick mention that we not only have some resources that can be helpful, but we have ways to participate that are actually, I think, kind of cool. So I wanted to share them with you. One is if you have a well that um, for a fair, it can be a well that's being used, but at least for a fair amount of the day is not used so that it gets to what's called its static level, which is what the level of the groundwater is in the well. Um, we will come measure it if you let us. Um, and it's joining the observation well network. And so I can show you, again, if you come to the table and you're interested, there's a link that we have on our website and it shows all the wells that are participating across Oregon and there's a fair amount of them in the Applegate. And the usefulness for you is that you can start to look around where you live and it'll start to show changes in what the static water level is, which is not the indicator, but it's an indicator of how groundwater is doing in your area. So super useful. Um, we have a certain amount that we can manage as, as an agency, but it's super helpful to have people who are willing to participate because it just helps everyone. So if you're interested, get in touch with me. And the other thing is we are currently looking for an Agrimet station to put in Provolt in two weeks. So uh, I'm gonna give you a little spiel about this which is that um, they're super cool. They're like little weather stations. It's a 10 foot by 10 foot footprint. Um, and it collects all those different things that are on the slide. And again, it becomes public information. So it's for the public benefit. Um, and it's tied to a, a whole database system that the Bureau of Reclamation manages. So we wouldn't normally have access to it but we will because we're participating in this, in this program. Um, so it's super useful for just, again, thinking about how best to use the water that you have for your crops and irrigation. Um, and we're expanding the network to those different cities, one of you, cities and towns, one of which you'll notice is Provolt. And we're going to be going to look at sites on Thursday and Friday. So if you're interested, come see me after. Um, we are looking for a place that's fairly open so that there's not uh, treat, like obstacles for uh, gathering the data. And that is my spiel. Oops, and I took way too long. Sorry. Thank you.